What are we going to do this week? This week, I'm going to do an introduction to the church at Pergamum, the letter of Jesus Christ to the church at Pergamum, kind of give you a little bit about uh, Pergamum, what went on there, and that type of thing. We'll take a look at the scripture, then we will move into uh, a prophecy update. Uh, this, a lot of the substance about what I'm going to talk about, about Pergamum, um, as I was preparing it this week, it's a much more involved um, thing than I really had planned on doing. Uh, there's much, much of what is going on in the modern church in America and in the world that has its roots back at Pergamum. And you'll see a little bit about that when I get into that in just a moment. So um, the Church of Pergamum and then a pro uh, prophecy update. <clears throat> there will be probably also a prophecy update next week. Provided Dr. Erdman leaves me uh, time to do it. So this is, uh, by the way, well, you'll see a picture of Pergamum in just a minute. Um, so the book of Revelation starts off with chapter one. It's divided into three sections. Chapter one, the things you have seen. Chapters two and three, the seven letters to the seven churches, the things that are. And then chapters four to 22, things that shall be hereafter. So the, we're gonna, we're focusing on chapters two and three here for a while and Jesus standing among the seven lampstands, each <coughs> representing the lampstand of one of the churches. As a reminder, the seven churches of Revelation have many different applications. There is a local application. Each church uh, in the body of Jesus Christ will have characteristics at some point or another, and maybe all at the same time, of the, of the seven churches of Revelation. So the seven churches, it, it's local, it applies to every church. It's also personal. Each believer is given warnings and can take application from what's said in the letter of Jesus, the letters of Jesus to each of these seven churches. It also has a prophetic and historical aspect to it in that the churches of Revelation are in the order of the predominant church issue of the different ages of the church since the founding of the church at Pentecost. Uh, that's this timeline that, uh, that we've done. The first church that we looked at was the church at Ephesus. And the church at Ephesus was from Pentecost till about 100 AD. That would have been the church that existed at the time John was writing the book of Revelation in the late 90s. John himself had probably been the pastor at Ephesus. It's believed that that's where Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, lived and died. At, and John was there, of course, taking care of her, as Jesus had asked him to do at the cross. That was a church that was not lasting. It started well, but it did not finish well. And if you go to Turkey today, this, I mean, this was a tremendous church. The Apostle Paul was there, and was really the, one of the founders of the church, or the founder of the church, and discipled the elders there for several years. He came back in Acts chapter 20 and told them, look guys, even with that rich heritage, there are some among you, there are, are going to be wolves. Some of you elders are going to be wolves and lead the flock astray. So the concern about false teaching was there even among the apostles, by the, it was present in the apostle Paul among the elders that he himself had trained and discipled over a period of time in Ephesus. But the church didn't last, and you can go to Ephesus today, and you can see the ruins of a church, but you see no church. The, the church is pretty much, uh, very few Christians live in the whole area of Turkey where these seven churches are. The next church is the church in Smyrna, the persecuted church. You'll be persecuted for 10 days probably meaning 10 eras of persecution that took place in the church from about 100 AD to 312. That was the predominant period of that time. Um, the church at Ephesus was one of the churches that did not get any condemnation from the Lord in what they did. 
The next church that we'll talk about today is the church of Pergamon, the church where Satan dwells. The next church that we'll talk about is Thyatira, which represents the era, uh, the predominant era of Roman Catholicism in the Middle and Dark Ages, where the uh, church practices continual sacrifice, where Jesus Christ has to be sacrificed on an altar in Catholic churches all over the world uh, many, many dozens and hundreds of times each day. It's completely contrary to scripture where Jesus, in Hebrews, it talks about Jesus did his work on the cross and he ascended to the right hand of the Father and he sat down. He sat down because his work in salvation was finished. It was complete. It was full. He does not need to be re-sacrificed. That era ended with the, uh, the Reformation, 1517, and then the church at Sardis. You know, the Reformation started well, but eventually those churches became dead churches. If you look at Germany, where Martin Luther was, uh, you know, nailed his theses to the wall about 400, uh, 500 years ago, the church is dead. And it, the Reformation started well, but it did not end well. We'll talk about that when we get to it. Then the great missionary of the church represented by the church of Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love that held fast to the teaching and was one of the other churches that received no condemnation from Jesus in his uh, evaluation of them. And then finally, the last church, the church before Jesus comes, the Laodicean church. The church, Laodicea, meaning the church of people's opinions. Everybody has their own idea about how things should be done. And, um, you know, you could go to church after church around America today and the world and find out that that's the case. We don't like this worship music. We don't like that song. We don't like um, that the pastor steps outside beside the pulpit. He doesn't wear a tie. Um, he wears the same suit week after week, uh, you know, things like that. So people, everybody has their opinion about something that bothers them. So that's the church. So that's the uh, eras of the church, the seven churches of Revelation. Uh, and the churches, each of the churches you find got in the evaluation of Jesus Christ, got a report card. It starts off with the title of Christ, something that uh, is a, mention something about Christ that the church needs to be reminded of, some aspect of his ministry. Uh, the church at Ephesus, again, that church um, had some commendations, but it was also condemned because it did not hold fast to itself. The church at Smyrna, uh, Myrrh represent part of the word of Smyrna. The name kind of indicates where the church was, and it's a persecuted church, and it was the one church that did not receive any condemnation from Jesus. And then now today we're going to talk about the Church of Pergamum. So let's put the Church of Pergamum in its historical context because even though I've taught on this before, I did a little bit more research this time, and there's a fascinating history to that area of Pergamum. It relates to Bible prophecy. And I think there are indicators in what Jesus talks about with regard to the church of Pergamum that will also be characteristic of the church in the end times just before Jesus returns. Pergamum is located in Asia Minor. It's the northernmost of the cities of the seven churches of Revelation. It's located inland. Now, it has an interesting geography, and we need to just sort of review something for just a moment. Now, when we went through... Uh, Revelation 17 uh, of a few months ago, we talked about the different beast empires, these empires that came about uh, over time, represented by the statute, at least four of them represented, four or five of them, I mean, <coughs> represented by the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream about in Daniel chapter 2. That Daniel came, remember, and he told him not only the dream, but the interpretation. And the king had made a test. You tell me what the dream was and what it meant. And nobody really wanted to take that job because the penalty for not doing it correctly was death. But in uh, starting in about 332 uh, BC, uh, remember that 
the Babylonian Empire had taken Israel into captivity, the last uh, deportation taking place in 586 BC. Daniel was also part of the, probably in the first deportation. And the Babylonian Empire existed up until 538 BC. At that time, remember the writing on the wall in Daniel, the Babylonian Empire was taken over by the Medo-Persian Empire, destroyed it one night, it fell in one night, very similar to how the Babylon in Revelation falls in one hour, one day in Revelation 18. Uh, I think there's a parallel there. Then uh, the Medo-Persian Empire sort of dominated that area for a while, but then uh, Daniel has these prophecies in Daniel 7, 8 and elsewhere about the uh, Alexander the Great and the Macedonian or the Greek Empire that came into being with uh, Alexander the Great, the son of Philip of Macedonia. He greatly expanded the Macedonian Empire. He started in Greece uh, about 331, and he went from Macedonia, in Greece, uh, modern day Greece, all the way through this region in a period of less than 10 years. Took over a massive empire, one of the largest empires in land size in history. It went all the way from Europe to the Indus, Indus Valley in modern day India and Pakistan. He took over that whole era, area. He ended up coming back. His capital was at Persopolis, but he uh, came back to Babylon and he died there at the age of 33, uh, weeping because there were no worlds left to conquer. When Alexander died, he had four generals. He had no offspring. So there was nobody to inherit the kingdom from him. So he had four generals, uh, Seleucus, Ptolemy, uh, and a couple other guys here. And they divided the kingdom eventually over the next oh, 10 or 15 years into four parts. The largest uh, land area was the Seleucid Empire. That empire existed up into the just before the time of Christ. You can read about that in Daniel 11, uh, some of the things that were going on there and the, with the, uh, the Maccabees and the Hasmonean revolt that took place. Then uh, uh, Ptolemy was, uh, took over Egypt, but there were one king, one of the generals, he left and for a short time, well, probably less than 100 years, he set up a kingdom that existed in the capital of which was Pergamum. Um, the king of, of Antigonus and Demetrius. So that w one of them went to Pergamum, set up his capital because of the strategic character of Pergamum. We'll talk about that now. And that kingdom, eventually they melded into two and then eventually it was subsumed in the, um, within the Seleucid Empire. Now, the interesting thing to keep remember is that there are these patterns that play themselves out in Bible prophecy over and over again. And one of the things that happened was we know that there was a priesthood uh, in Babylon at the time of Daniel. We know that some of those men existed even up until the time of Christ because they came because we've seen his star in the east. And they, where is he who's born king of the Jews? They knew that was going to happen, but eventually the priesthood uh, disbanded in Babylon and they migrated. They migrated across um, the desert, they migrated across Turkey, and they ended up and reestablished themselves in a town called Pergamum. So the Babylonian priesthood that was ex existent at the time of the Babylonian Empire and afterwards eventually migrated to Pergamum and set up its headquarters there. Now that has significance because you can see a lot of, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a couple weeks, but a lot of the aspects of the uh, Babylonian system, the uh, priest robes that they wore, the hats they wore and everything, have now migrated even a little bit further to a place called Rome where they have been adopted wholeheartedly by the Roman Catholic Church. You see a lot of the Babylonian priesthood things in that church. And I would say, I, I don't know if it's still in print or not, but uh, one of the best books on this topic is Dave Hunt's book, 
a woman rights a beast. If you, it is, um, I've often said that if I have to instruct somebody in how to do a footnote or how to footnote something, Dave Hunt's book is the way to do it because it is filled with footnotes and extra material in those footnotes. So I would highly recommend that you read it. Now, I'm not sure I agree necessarily with Dave's ultimate conclusion, but everything he says about what went on with Roman Catholicism and how it adopted the pagan culture, how um, pagan Roman temples became churches, and the mother-child uh, false teaching that came out of the Babylonian system was adopted wholeheartedly in the Roman Catholic Church. It's a false system. But the important thing for our topic here today is that the priesthood left Babylon and migrated to Pergamum. Now, Pergamum was a, uh, is an interesting city. There is a plain surrounding uh, what we would call the Acropolis of Pergamum. And the uh, Acropolis, here you're looking at the Acropolis from a thing called the Sanctuary of uh, As Asclepios. Um, and what happened in that worship there was it was centered around a serpent, snakes. It also had a belief that there were essentially four, if I have this correct, four bodily fluids that would determine your personality and what was wrong with you. And so this was also uh, these, you could find out a lot about human temperaments by measuring these things. And that, that temple, the center of that religion, was located there in that, what you see the ruins of. And you can see pictures of some of the pillars there. You see the snakes and the pillars. And then uh, Asclepios, which was a child of two Greek gods, uh, he has, you see the physician's staff with the snake on it. Uh, a lot of things that uh, come into our modern era about how people try to analyze human behavior and everything came out of Pergamum. It comes into the church. I had a long discussion this week with a lady who called me concerned about her, ch her church using psych the psychology temperament test. Now, I did some research on the ones that they're using. It's interesting, there is a, a scholarly paper that traces the development of these tests. He doesn't go all the way back to Pergamum, although I think it would be very easy for him to do. He actually goes back and ties, and this is an evangelical church, my friends. He ties them into the development in the 1800s, the 19th century, of a thing called Christian science. And he said they're virtually indistinguishable from Christian science. Now, I'm not saying this to, um, so this week, not, the lady called me to ask me these questions about what was going on in her church. She was very concerned. And while we were on the phone, an email came in from Tim LaHaye Ministries because he uses the four temperament analysis test. Now, I've never figured out my temperament. Um, I, I don't like these tests. I, I don't think psychology is biblical. Uh, shape, this has came out of the Purpose Driven Movement. Rick Warren, uh, finding and fulfilling your unique purpose for life. That also is based purely on psychology, but it has its roots all the way back there in Asclepios, the sanctuary of Asclepios in Pergamum. A lot of the elements that were present there have come forward into psychology. And psychology is really, um, look, I took psychology, I've been on the board of a Christian college where psychology is the biggest major. And I would think that you would go to most Christian colleges and you would find that psychology is maybe the biggest major. And I, as a, over time, I have become very concerned about that because psychology is a humanist-based religion. It is really anti-science. It has a lot of opinions about things, 
but it really doesn't have the answer. And I think Jacob mentioned this last week. If you want to understand human psychology, read and the biblical from a biblical perspective, read the book of, of Proverbs. And that will tell you what you need to know about human psychology. So this is a problem. Now, Pergamon was selected by this general uh, because of its strategic location. This is a, a view that you would get from the top of the Acropolis. And Pergamum, back in the days in that a uh, couple of centuries from 100 to 312, or I'm sorry, during, back in the Pergamum era of the church, back in this time uh, in the first, second, third century, Pergamum was a city of about 120,000 people. It was very wealthy, it had a strategic position, it could control trade routes. It also had a library there. Here's a representation of Pergamum. Uh, this amphitheater, uh, which was the steepest bowl, uh, I think some of the modern architects have gone to Pergamum when, when they designed the upper deck of like Ohio State Stadium and uh, uh, Nationwide Arena. Uh, this was the steepest bowl in antiquity, and this amphitheater would seat 10, 000, over 10,000 people. Uh, there are a number of prominent features in Pergamum. Uh, there was a library at Pergamum that had 200,000 volumes, all handwritten, all paper. It was the largest library outside of Alexandria in the ancient world. So the people there were very well educated. They had access to vast amounts of knowledge and information. But the city was pagan to the core. Uh, there was a temple to Athena, there was a temple to Diana, and then there was a temple to Trajan. Um, so this is the, actually this is uh, Dionysius uh, temple there in the red circle, uh, the temple to Diana, temple to Trajan and then this <coughs> temple over here which we're going to focus on for probably the rest of my little short talk today on Pergamum this was the great altar to Zeus that existed at Pergamum here's another view of it and over here you can see there I've highlighted the altar to Zeus uh, that's why when Pergamum taught when, when uh, Jesus letter talks about Satan's throne you know, this looks like a great big easy chair. That's where Satan's throne was. That's what people believe Satan's throne actually was, actually there in Pergamum. And again, here's a little bit closer view of it. It sat there in a very prominent part. There was a continual sacrifice that took place there to the Roman emperors. This was the first place in the Roman Empire where emperor worship was sanctioned. So I want, what I'm trying to get you to understand and trying to convey is that much evil came out of Pergamum. It resided there, it was present there, and things that still affect us in our world and culture even today had their roots, their genesis back in the city of Pergamum. So when Jesus gives his letter to the church of Pergamum, and tells them that this is where Satan dwells, we need to listen. So let, listen to what, uh, there were temples to Athena, Dionysius, Demeter, Hera, and Asclepius, who I mentioned earlier was the savior god represented by a snake. Augustus Caesar, this was the first place that they auth authorized worship of a Roman emperor, Augustus Caesar, you know him from the story in Luke uh, about Jesus' birth. And um, this uh, temple, they sacrificed to the Roman emperors. And the smoke, it was a continual burning and smoke that went up. Okay, so if you want to look, open your Bible to Revelation chapter 2. I'm going to play a short video with no sound. Uh, they'll sort of take you on a visual tour of Pergamon while I'm reading what the uh, scripture has to say. The message to Pergamon and to the angel of the church, this is Revelation 2, verse 12, and to the angel of the church in Pergamon write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, 
I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you who hold fast my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you, were, you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. So you have also some in the same way hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but who receives it. So here in Pergamum is this magnificent altar to Zeus. It has the Greek gods represented in uh, freses on the outside of the temple. And then again, below in that center area there, that's where the altar itself was and the sacrifice would have taken place. Now much of this altar is still in existence. Not though at Pergamum, and that's uh, where I'll go next. So uh, here is again another view of the city of Pergamum. And again, the, the title of Christ is here is the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. This is a continual theme, represents the word of God. So, and then it says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. You hold fast my name and did not deny my faith. So there today, if you go there today, you will see this remnant of the Zeus altar at Pergamum. And someone is, uh, we live in the day of Photoshop, so... Someone has put in what it might have looked like back in those days. Now, if you want to see the altar of Zeus, you can go to Berlin. And you can go to a place called, uh, I don't know where they came up with the name for this, it's called the Pergamum Museum. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened was someone uh, from Germany went there uh, in, early in the 20th century and was concerned that uh, things were being taken away, things were being uh, destroyed, these uh, treasures of antiquity. So he decided that he was going to take these treasures of antiquity and take them to a museum in Berlin. And one of the things that he did was he dismantled much of the, uh, these freses and uh, what he could find with the structure and brought them to Pergamum and actually built a life-size altar of Zeus there in the city of Berlin. I believe the museum opened back in the 1920s. At that time in Germany, there was a man rising to power. His name was Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler hired, had a, de a devoted follower named Albert Speer. Speer was the architect of the Nazi regime. And Speer was fascinated with this particular altar, the altar of Zeus. And so when Speer was asked to design the rally grounds for the Nazis at Nuremberg, he incorporated that design into Hitler's podium and rally grounds. And Hitler's podium would have been here under the, the big uh, swastika. And so they would have these massive rallies at a building, at a podium, designed, at, inspired by the altar of Zeus, Satan's throne. Now, I would think that if this wasn't true and I, you thought you didn't know this was true, you would think this is not possible. But it is possible. And this kind of grand architecture has been incorporated in many other places. I'm sure some of you are aware. Here's a picture of Nuremberg at night, a massive night rally. 
these searchlights pointing up to the sky. Spear called this his cathedral of light. To me, that this was is this is referenced in Revelation in the letters of the seven churches by Jesus, and that this unspeakably evil regime which took it upon itself to wipe out the Jewish people and others back in the 30s and 40s was inspired by what was going on, the pagan temples, the pagan altar to the god Zeus in Pergamum. Therefore, we would be remiss if we thought that Pergamum was just some old city with a bunch of stones and ruins laying around modern-day Turkey. It's not. It's significant. What happened at Pergamum and what was going on in Pergamum has a message not only to the church of Pergamos, but a message and warning to the church in the world today. So we are going to look at that next week. We'll talk about the things about Balaam. We'll talk about the white stone, the hidden manna. And we will look at that. It's a fascinating study, and it's not going to be next week. It's going to be in two weeks because we have a guest speaker next week. So, any questions about Pergamon before I move on to the prophecy update? Dale? I'll make sure that you show the Acropolis. Uh, the Acropolis was in the foreground or up on the hill in the background? The Acropolis would have been up on the hill in the back, in the, okay. up on top of the hill. Just like the Acropolis in. Athens is built up on top of a hill so that it's predominant over the city. So the, the town of Pergamum would have been down in the valley and they would have walked up to the high place where they would worship. They had all their temples and the library and everything there. It was um, the Zeus altar that you saw was about 800 feet higher than the town around it. So about an 80 story building. So to walk up that was about a 100-story building. So it's not an insignificant climb. Uh, so there's this big outcrop up here, but it was a very strategic place. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Does the, does the snake around the, um, the oath of Hippocrates have anything to do with all this? Yes. Yes, yeah, so that all comes from Greek culture. The question was, does the snake wrapped around the staff have any relationship to the uh, Hippocratic Oath, the, the symbol of the Hi Hippocratic Oath? And the answer is yes, it does. That's where it came from. Okay, and it's interesting. Now, I have not, this is a little bit off topic, I have not seen the movie Noah. I'm not going to go see the movie Noah, and frankly, I am deeply troubled that many churches have recommended people go see the movie Noah. Um, I've seen this all over America. That movie is a pagan movie. I think Ken Ham nailed it correctly. The only thing that relates to the Bible is that there's a flood, Noah, and an ark. Other than that, it's all made up. Uh, there's a, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but if you look for it on the internet, you can find it. There's an excellent analysis of the movie that ties this into Kabbalah mysticism and pagan mysticism, and it talks about how Noah at one point is offered the serpent's skin. This is a, a thing that comes from Kabbalah. It's pagan, it's not Christian, and that movie celebrates that, that th there was some kind of power in this serpent skin that somebody wanted to transfer to Noah. And I believe he does he has trouble until he gets the snake skin back, is what I've been told is in the movie. So the movie is, I mean, you can still talk to your friends about it, ask them what they saw in the movie, and then say, well, let's look at what the Bible says about what happened. Okay, now the Bible story is not that long. Certainly not as long as a, a you know, you can probably read through it in 10 or 11 minutes. Um, it's not as long as a, wouldn't make a two hour movie, but they made a movie about it anyway. But the fact that so many evangelicals were duped into recommending that movie is 
itself a sign that we have some very serious problems in the world and the church. So let's do a prophecy update. I'll try to do a few things that I was going to do at the conference last week. Again, we talk continually about the convergence of events that are taking place. All of these lines of prophecy are moving forward, being put in place, I think fulfilled in some respects. Everything is getting ready to be fulfilled, and all of them are going to converge at some point at the second return of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus comes back at the end of the 70th week of Daniel to set up his throne and his millennial kingdom from which he will rule and reign for a thousand years. This is, I think, a kind of significant development. Uh, I have said for some time that Christians need to be prepared to lose their jobs if they speak out or even take a stand on the issue of same-sex marriage. And here was a man, now this man was a well-respected uh, computer programmer, I think he helped develop JavaScript, uh, and he was hired as the CEO of Mozilla, which makes the Firefox browser, which is the one I use. And it was discovered, now he was just hired a couple weeks, a few weeks ago as CEO, Back in 2008, he made a $1,000 donation in support of Proposition 8, the California amendment that 52% of California voters said they would support traditional marriage. It came out that he had given a contribution to them and the left-wing totalitarian leftists got rid of him. He lost, he had to resign, and people at Mozilla on the board and things are saying this is a wonderful thing for Mozilla and now we know Mozilla is tolerant. And there was no evidence that this man had ever acted in a discriminatory fashion towards uh, homosexual people at all, okay? He didn't try to undo uh, Mozilla's uh, same-sex benefits that they give or domestic partner benefits, but because he had made a thousand dollar contribution and he had taken a stand He's out of a job, a very well-paying job. And if you think that it stops at the top with Mozilla, the CEO of Mozilla, I think you're very naive. I've feared that this day is coming, and uh, I think you know probably as a church and other churches need to take a look at how are we gonna respond to this when people in our church start losing their jobs because they took a stand based on what God says in the Bible. Um, it's coming. Now, related to that, this person from Google, uh, their director of corporate giving, Jacqueline Fuller, had been on the board of World Vision. And you remember, World Vision came out and said, we're not going to ask people any questions about whether they're in the same-sex relationship or anything like that, because we don't want to be divisive, and you know, we're not taking a theological position. They were taking a theological position. It's amazing that uh, it, it went through the whole board and was approved. Now, I don't know what the vote was at the board level, but the board approved it by a majority vote. One of the people on the board was Jacqueline Fuller. And why she's significant in the story is that <coughs> World Vision was hit with a lot of people saying, I'm done with World Vision, I'm not supporting them. Donations drop, money talks. So World Vision reversed itself and said that yes, they still stood on biblical values. But the result of that was Jacqueline Fuller, who works at Google, their director of corporate giving, and Google's a very valuable company these days, she resigned from the board in protest of the reversal. Now, why would she do that? Well, A is connected to B. Because what happened to the Mozilla person, if she stayed on the board at World Vision, there would have been calls for her to resign from her position or be terminated by Google. I guarantee you, I, there's no doubt that that's the sole reason that she did that. But you know, look, we shouldn't be surprised about this because Jesus said one of the characteristics of the end times would be it would be like the days of Lot. Now, let's look at Israel for just a moment. We didn't have a chance to do this. Um, I actually, Bill Keeney offered to bring me up to New York to go to this with him today. So. The sacrifice I'm making for you people. Oh. 
I probably would have, I, I don't think I could have done it physically. I'm pretty tired. Um, plus, it's online. That's why I'm telling you this. Uh, if you go home, go to jpost.com. Uh, Caroline Glick will be speaking around 2.20, I think. And then uh, about an hour later, she'll be on a panel talking about Israel and security uh, with some other big wigs. So this is a great conference that they have to discuss issues related to Israel. So jpost.com, and you should be able to find it pretty easily. Now, Bill Keeney, you know, wrote a book many years ago about uh, uh, what happens when governments, particularly the American government, tries to divide the land of Israel. And it's interesting that in the Dry Bones cartoon a couple weeks ago, I don't know if you saw this, but it picked up on that theme. And the panels say this, could the reversals in American prestige and power be due to the biblical curse on those who betray Israel? What? Are you insane? A religious fanatical nutcase? How can you even suggest that? There's a biblical curse. And it's true that there is. A lot of people refuse to recognize this. This is Jonathan Martin. He's a pastor at a church in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, Reno Renovatus, Renovatus Church. Now, he wrote about his views on Israel and the peace process with the Palestinians um, on a blog post. It was interesting. There were a couple of Palestinian people that showed up at the conference at Purdue, and they were very animated, uh, very direct. They just didn't think it was fair that Israel, look, Israel was there a long time ago, but things have changed. Now, I resisted the temptation to ask her. I said, well, if you were okay with things changing 2,000 years ago, then things changing in your lifetime or your parents' lifetime should be a big deal, right, as to who's in control of the land. But I. I did resist the temptation to do that because I didn't think it would be helpful to the discussion. Um, but she was very passionate about how she's denied her rights, although she was very inconsistent when she was asked about, so your, your father can't own land. Oh no, we own land. My brother can't get an apartment now because he doesn't have a job. And you know, so there were some very inconsistencies there. But, a couple years ago, Jonathan Martin wrote about the peace process, and I want to look at that because then I'm going to lead into just a couple clips from the Christ at the Checkpoint conference that took place in Bethlehem a few weeks ago now. You can still find, if you go to Vimeo.com and type in Christ at the Checkpoint, you can look at all the videos that they have up from their three conferences. Um, now, it's interesting. I, I, I often find that one of the ways to find out where a pastor that you don't know anything about is coming from is to look at what he's reading, what he's recommending to be read, and what he's thinking about. And so if you go to his uh, page, uh, there's a book by Gregory Boyd. Now, I played a clip of him at the conference where he was kind of had this weird idea about what Revelation meant and all that stuff. And Boyd is, is known as someone who, you know, he has this book that was out and sold uh, a few hundred thousand copies, I believe. Letters to a skeptic, letters from a skeptic about a conversation he had with his father. Boyd believes in open theism that God doesn't know the future. Uh, there, that's was popularized by a guy I think up at Huntington named Clark Pennock. The sort of the theological muscle behind that view. But Jonathan Martin on his webpage recommends. It says I'm reading this book right now by Greg Boyd, and it's called Benefit of the Doubt. Breaking the Idol of Certainty. Now, it doesn't make any sense. It's, it's one of these things that so often in the emergent church, the postmodern types, what they say is self-refuting. Breaking the Idol of Certainty. So what? You can worship at the idol of uncertainty, which is what you really want to do. You want things to be uncertain. Or a statement by emergence that they make. There is no such thing as absolute truth. And the question would be, are you sure about that? Are you certain about that? So it's a self-refuting worldview. But this is where the guy's coming from. And so much of people who claim to be 
evangelicals. Look at a little bit of what he says. Disclaimer first, I'm not bashful about the fact that I've been greatly shaped by people who ministered to Arab Palestinian Christians. First and foremost, by my spiritual grandmother, Sister Margaret Gaines. I find that many evangelical Christians are still surprised that they have Arab brothers and sisters in the West Bank, given our over-preoccupation with Israel as a nation state. Now this is the way people on the, uh, Paul Wilkinson calls it Christian Palestinianism. People on that view, this is how they argue. They make up straw men and people that don't exist. I do not know a person who believes in the, you know, reconstituting the nation of Israel that doesn't know that we have Arab Christian brothers and sisters. In fact, probably the leading organizations that complain about the persecution in Arab lands are people who hold that particular eschatological viewpoint. So this is a canard. This is a false statement, a rumor that he's basing his thing on. And at some point, you have to wonder, is the guy just ignorant or is he lying? Is he just willfully ignorant? So he goes on. Yet still for many evangelical Christians, these matters are simple. Israel is God's side and therefore should be our side. And this is about good versus bad, light versus darkness. Anything less than a ringing endorsement of all Israeli policies is seen as an affront to the living God. And Mike, you remember we talked about this at dinner with David Hawking the other night, and I said, I, I resent comments like that. I don't agree with everything that Israel does. I think Netanyahu should have bombed Iran a long time ago. <laughs> See, I disagree with Israel. Um, but this is what they say. And so we don't agree with everything that Israel does, but we believe God has a plan. This position is largely determined by eschatological convictions, beliefs about the end of the world, in which Israel as a modern nation state exists as a fulfillment of prophecy. Yep, that's accurately stated. For some evangelicals, if you send money to an organization that wants to bring Jews from around the world to Israel, then you are likely to get cancer or speeding tickets, less likely to get cancer or speeding tickets, or more likely to get a promotion at work. That's a canard. That's a false statement. That's a straw, whatever you want to call it. He goes on to talk about his view of eschatology. When Jesus ascended, he was not leaving us for our own devices, but rather ascending to take his rightful place as Lord over the world. Since we believe that Jesus is Lord over the world already, we do not have to be anxious about helping prophecies along to make sure things work out right in the end. And every time I hear this, I, I ask the person, show me one person in power that makes decisions that believes Israel's a fulfillment of modern prophecy. And they, the only answer I ever got is, well, James Watt did. Well, he was in the Reagan administration 30 some years ago. Anybody else? And what, and what influence, he was the Secretary of the Interior, what influence did he have over foreign policy? I'm telling you folks, this, when you get in these discussions with people, it's evidence that they've lost the ability to reason goes on. This is why I say many Christians have a surprisingly low Christology. They do not believe resurrection has already changed the world and feel the need to force prophecy towards some kind of fulfillment. That's, again, an untrue statement. You know, we, we look forward to God unfolding and working out his plan, but we're not forcing anything. They do not believe that Jesus is Lord over the world, thus they put their faith in human governments or systems to take their place in order for God to accomplish his purposes in the world. The dominionists are on his side of the ledger, not on the people who believe in eschatology. Or the, then he goes, in fact, many of them express a perverse pleasure when there is suffering in the Middle East. I, I would challenge him to show me one person who takes pleasure in that, because these are mere signs that the end is drawing near. That end is not defined first and foremost as the reign of the Prince of Peace breaking out into the world with healing for the nations, but the vindication of those on the right side of Armageddon by the heavenly Godfather. This man is massively confused. In fact, many of them express a, well, I've already read that. So, now listen. This is a common view in evangelicalism. I saw this post on a church Facebook page this week. It's, quoting from the Willbank report from the Lausanne 
movement. The Lausanne movement is a large evangelical missions-based movement that many evangelical churches and denominations and fellowships have bought into. Everything pretty much goes in the Lausanne movement except Bible prophecy. Uh, there was a paper put out by uh, David Wells and somebody else talking about by people who believe in Bible prophecy as the curmudgeons of the evangelical movement. That's an insult. That's a slander. That's a libel from the lips of David Wells and his co-author, who I can't remember right now. But this is what the Willowbank Report says. We deplore the pessimism which leads some Christians to disapprove of active cultural engagement in the world and the defeatism which persuades others that they could do no good there anyway and should therefore wait in an activity for Christ to put things right when he comes. That is a bold-faced lie about people who believe in future or futurists with respect to eschatology. It's a lie. And the people that make this statement and support it and propagate it should apologize because it's false. It's a canard. It's a rumor that people make up. Okay? And there was a whole conference that dedicated to this. They're getting a little better. This was a, at Christ at the Checkpoint just a, about a month ago. Dialogue on Replacement Theology. Gary, Gary Burge from Wheaton and Daniel Jester. Now, Gary Burge has written a couple books. Uh, Whose Land, Whose Promise. Um, Jesus in the Land, the New Testament Challenge to Holy Land Theology. He is a replacement theologian. There have been many errors noted in his book. There's an organization called CAMERA, the Committee for Accuracy in Middle East Reporting in America. They wrote back in January to the president of Wheaton and said, what are you going to do about your professor who has been confronted and refused that your, your New Testament professor at Wheaton has been confronted about the errors in his book. What are you going to do about it? Here's the response from, uh, I think this is the pro Stanton Jones, the provost at Wheaton. Dear Mr. Van Zyl, he's from Cameron. Thank you for your letter of concern. After careful study of your expressed concerns, I find insufficient basis on which to respond in any formal way to faculty member Professor Gary Burge. The matters of concern which you address are extraordinarily complex. To describe the causation of such historically complex events and articulate their meaning and ethical implications as both you and Dr. Burge do in your writing always involves interpretation and selective presentation of issues. Okay, here's the translation of that paragraph. Don't send your kid to Wheaton. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, this is, this is postmodern thought, you know. Whether or not I agree with his conclusion, what you have documented is that there are different possible interpretations of these events based on attributing different significance to possibly related events. It sounds like legal briefs I get or letters I get from other counsel sometimes. You have not documented that Dr. Burge engaged in the kind of dishonesty, plagiarism, or other unethical behavior that would require any administrative action. In other words, uh, buzz off. So here's a discussion that took place, uh, Gary Burge talking at, at the conference about his view. Now, I, I wonder if we need a new vocabulary for this, because it seems to me that when we talk about blessing Israel, that gets congested with all kinds of other political and sort of cultural ideas, you know? Um, I'm wondering if a new vocabulary would talk about honoring Israel, respecting Judaism, but this ocean of blessing has implied in it endorsements that we probably don't want to all make. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's his view. Another talk there was a talk by Alex Awad uh, from Bethlehem. Uh, their theology our nightmare, talking about people who believe like we do here in the future unfolding of events. The Bible calls us to be peacemakers. Could it be that rumors of war come true because we haven't sought to advance a gospel of peace? In other words, you people who believe that Armageddon is coming, you're the ones who are responsible for Armageddon coming. 
uh, listen to what he says and, and listen to the tone of his uh, description and discussion that he engages in. Uh oh. Old Testament prophecies, although uttered thousands of years ago, are being fulfilled in Israel today and have been since 1948, when the Jewish state was born. And that's also what they emphasize this. Now, here is the definition of Zionism. There are many definitions of Christian Zionism, but here is one uh, definition. Christian Zionists interpret both the Torah and the New Testament as prophetic texts that describe future events of how the world will one day end with the return of Jesus from heaven to rule the earth. Israel and its people are central to their vision. They interpret passages from the books of Ezekiel, Daniel, and Isaiah as foreshadowing the coming uh, of the Christian era. Well, this is behind Christian support for the state of Israel. Uh, some more of the Zionist convictions. The creation of the Jewish state is a miracle of divine intervention on behalf of the Jewish people and visible sign of the end time and the soon coming of Christ. The current conflict in the Middle East is caused by Palestinians, Arabs, and Muslims who are out of touch with the will of God as it concerns the land of Israel. So we are at fault because we don't voluntarily get out of this country. Um, Look, this is what I talked about, you know, with regard to the monitors. When all this stuff is going on, um, we saw recently Prime Minister Netanyahu said uh, his military should prepare for a strike at Iran in 2014. Here's another little clip from Alex Awad, and we'll close with this. Uh, are the promises given to the Jewish people un uh, un unconditional? Are the promises perpetual, never ending? Do Old Testament prophecies relating to the land require fulfillment within the framework of the new covenant? Does God have a special or different plan to the Jewish people? Here we are. Are these promises unconditional? And now I'm using uh, verses from the Bible. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am okay. God Almighty. He goes on. Are the promises conditional? In Ezekiel 36 especially, God talks about the fact that he will restore the nation of Israel, not because they deserved it, but because he said he would, and his holy name is at stake. As Christians, we should take great comfort in that because God reached out to us, demonstrated his love towards us by sending on his, his son, Jesus Christ, to be the perfect sacrifice in our place for the sins to satisfy the wrath of a just, holy, righteous, and loving God. And if we repent and accept that free gift, we are saved. We don't deserve it. We deserve the hottest hell, every single one of us. But God in his mercy reaches out to us just like God in his mercy reached out to the Jewish people and restored them to, our, to their land in most of our lifetimes. There is a direct parallel there between what Christians really believe or should believe and what happened to the nation of Israel. God did it in his mercy and in his plan, just like he reached out to each one of us and led us to, if we have, repent. And if you're not, you need to repent of your sins and accept the free gift of God. So we need to go, I could go on, on and on and on. So we'll go next week and let's close in a word of prayer. And next week, Martin Erdman, Transformation Theology, um, and I think he may do an expository sermon on a passage in the first hour, Transformation Theology, in the second hour. We'll have a short prophecy update if there's time. And uh, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your promise, the prophetic promises of your word that we can see uh, being the stage being set for their fulfillment in our lifetime. And thank you so much for letting us live at this time. Father, let that... Uh, what we see going on in the world motivate us to live holy lives dedicated to you and preparing ourselves, sanctifying ourselves 
and being ready to meet your son, our King, our Messiah, Jesus, when he returns. Bless us as we go this week. In Jesus' name, amen.